dank cavern located in the Bay of Fundy, accessible only when the tide is low. It is said that if one enters it and places a pouch of maple ash there, an ancient hag will appear and ask you three riddles. Should you answer these riddles correctly, you will be blindfolded and led into a hidden chamber. There, you will be given three physical trials, the true nature of which is unknown. If again you succeed at these, your blindfold will be lifted, and you will be permitted to read one page from the Canuckonomicon. Today, I shall share the contents of such a page. Ooh. <laughs> I have I have braved the ancient hag <laughs> and defeated a griffin in single combat. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's good. Yes. Good. Welcome back everyone. I'm Benjamin Wandio here with my producer and sometimes co-host Todd Dirty Clad Wandio. Hello, hello. So, a uh, really important announcement to kind of start off the episode today. I've recently had a big change in my job, and so for the next couple of weeks, we'll probably be on hiatus, at least until I know how busy work will have me being. After that, we'll probably come back on a reduced release schedule of once every two weeks rather than once every week, because I've just been having a hard time keeping up with a once a week release schedule, which, you know, I've done it for, what, over 30 weeks that's pretty good. Not consecutively, 16 weeks. I, I haven't looked at the stats on a um, on a podcast. Yeah. But I'm thinking, uh, you know, most podcasts probably run like five episodes. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I, I know I've definitely found a bunch that were like, we, they release three episodes and then just don't. I uh, know. It's hard work. It is. Maintaining a, a podcast. It is. Um, so, yeah, it's been difficult for me to keep up. We'll probably be back before too long. And uh, I'm ready to get right into it. Get right on it. But, uh, no, no. Oh, he's closing the door. That's what he's doing. So, Narcissa Arcand was a carpenter living in Canada. He was also the head of a labor union and a member of the Labor Party, which was founded in 1899. He joined in 1904. Um, The Labor Party was a left-wing pro-union political party. Um, The same year that it was founded, 1899, Narcissa had a son, Adrian. Adrian's mother was Marie-Anne Mathieu from the village of Saint-Marie in Quebec. Narcissa and Marianne had been married three years earlier, in 1896. Marianne would later go on to become a religion teacher and a school principal. Narcissa would continue to be a carpenter. Adrienne was not their first child. He was, in fact, the fourth. And his parents would go on to have another eight children, 12 in total. So... That was a pretty typical Quebec family in the day. (laughs) Still is in a lot of parts of Quebec. Every sperm is sacred. Yeah. So Narcissa, Adrian's father, was a tireless labor activist, and he was frustrated with the policies of Quebec's premier and of Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier. The Labor Party fought for free and compulsory education, welfare, health insurance, universal suffrage, and old age pensions. Uh, as well as policies against child labor and other radical leftist ideas that are totally not radical at all by today's standards. These are very, what we would now pretty much just take for granted. These are very, very standard, I would say, normal policies. Old age pensions, pretty much a given. Um, it is pretty much illegal to let your child of under the age of 14 work for more than a few hours a day, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, the Labor Party, though, especially in Quebec, faced very little success, even when Narcissa ran for the party himself. Ironically, at least in my mind, given the policies of the party at the time, the Catholic Church was actually one of the staunchest opponents of the Labor Party fearing that, quote, foreign ideas would somehow corrupt the French Canadians that were members of the party. Xenophobia, it seems, is always in style. And it 
honestly comes, at least to me, as no surprise that this foreign influence was often Semitic in nature. Oh. Jewish people were fleeing Europe in face of terrible living conditions and pogroms. So this is, like, still 30 years out from the rise of Hitler, but the Russian pogroms are going on at this time. You know, anti-Semitism was not just an event that happened prior to the Second World War. It, no. It was, it was a... Age-old tradition in Europe. Pervasive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so a lot of them would end up in Canada. Having few resources of their own, they often joined labor movements, as anybody in the lower working classes often did. Um, when you don't make a lot of money, things like free education and cheap health care really become quite appealing. Um, another group that was heavily involved in the labor movement were Chinese Canadians, although I will kind of say that the Labor Party did have some anti-immigration policies that were largely directed at Chinese Canadians, though they never expressly forbid Chinese Canadians from joining. Um, it was just, there was a lot of push against allowing the Chinese into the labor movement because, again, these are working class people and Chinese immigrants often worked for less. Yeah. Which is the same issue that you see in a lot of the United States today against um, Mexicans. It's not that there's actually anything wrong with these people. It's that they're coming in and they work for cheaper because they don't know they have rights. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's still what little they might work for is still better than what they could have earned yeah. where they were. Yeah. Yeah. And often life is just better. Yeah. It's the grass is greener issue, right? So uh, Chinese Canadians also had very little in the way of resources. And honestly, a lot of the people of the involved in the labor movement just lacked a certain white Britishness that was necessary to break into the upper classes in Canada. Um, the big push for the labor movement was education particularly in Quebec, where the Quebecers felt that they were being denied a higher place in society due mostly to the poor education that was kind of given, that was kind of the, the Canadienne could afford. Um, true to form, Narcissa and Marie-Anne ensured all their children received the best education that they could financially provide. Arcand was, uh, in particular, given quite a strong education that was very steeped in French nationalism. He studied with the, the Catholic Supl Supplicians, um, a religious order that had been in New France for, from pretty much the beginning. Formerly referred to as the Societas Presbyter Presbyterorum uh, Santo Suplitio, or Society of the Priests of St. Suplice, um, they were a major religious order located in the city of Montreal. They acted as initially as a uh, seigneurs of France. Um, so for those who have forgotten their junior high education and for our American friends, the seigneurial, seigneurial system was a system of land ownership. It was almost like uh, feudal. It was essentially feudalism. It was a little less harsh than feudalism, which when the seigneurial system was implemented in Canada was still in place in France. But rather than transfer over the entirety of the feudal system, they instituted the seigneurial system. So stretches of lands called seigneuries were owned by a seigneur or, or a manor lord, and these would be loaned out to peasants who were called habitants, uh, to farm and to live on. In return, these tenants had to pay the seigneur uh, uh, kind of a preset rent, as well as one sack of flour out of every 14 that they ground at the grist mill. And the seigneur was in charge of building the grist mill. Um, habitants, unlike true peasants, were more or less free to develop the land how they wanted to. Um, aside from the grist mill, the seigneurs had very few obligations to their tenants. So, in other words, they, the tenants weren't expected to give much. Once the rent was set, it was set at that amount forever. They, the seigneur couldn't increase the rent in order to get more money out of the peasants. They, they, once they set the rent, that's what it was. And once they built the grist mill, they got one bag of flour out of every 14 that any individual peasant ground at the mill. And that was all they got. So 
but in return, they also weren't expected to like defend the peasants against right. raiders or right. anything like that. There was very little that they could take from the peasants, and very little they had to give in return. Uh, so the, the, it was land, basically a gift of land in yeah. return for a small tax. Yeah, that was exactly it. Uh, and so the peasants or the habitants never really got as poor as peasants did in Europe. But at the same note, the seigneurs never got as rich as lords did in Europe. No. Um, so the Supplicians were seigneurs in this system. In the 18th century, uh, in fact, they literally stole land that was supposed to be granted to the Mohawks by the French crown. Oh. So uh, an agreement had been signed by the French crown um, saying this Big chunk of land is going to be given to the Mohawks, and next to it, this tiny chunk of land is going to be given to the Supplicians. Well, what ended up happening is the Supplicians changed the agreement so that both chunks of land would be given to them, and none of it would be given to the Mohawks. <laughs> Insidious. Yep. Um, but that said, in the 19th century, an influential Supplician priest had been translating the Bible into the Mohawk language and working very closely with them. But he mysteriously and suddenly died at a relatively young age after attending a ball and leaving home early feeling sick. To this day, there is an oral tradition that holds that the Supplicians had actually poisoned him because of the amount of influence he had over the Mohawks. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so, Adrian was attending their college in the early 20th century. So we're looking like 1904, 1905, around there. Um, the Supplicians were a relatively unremarkable religious order at this time. They were operating a seminary, uh, which is a school for training priests and theologians out of their college. Um about the most that can be said about them is that they were very, very French. Almost all the members of the Supplicien Order came from France. They weren't French Canadians. They were French. Um, and so there wasn't really much of note going on here aside from this very heavy French influence. Adrian was a member of the Boys Choir, and one of the songs they would frequently sing were these nationalistic hymns about Joan of Arc, who was the patron saint of France. He recalls singing that they were all descended from the Knights of Gaul and Germania and would frequently remark, if we're descended from the Germans, why do we hate them so much? So keeping in mind, this is around World War I. Yeah. So he doesn't understand why people hate the Germans so much. So he received what we might call a classical education in his younger years. So he's, you know, trained on the trivium, the 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 teachings of rhetoric, grammar, and logic, um, then later went on to receive something more like what we would call a liberal arts education nowadays, uh, particularly focused on languages, um, with some history, philosophy, religion, and fine arts mixed in, but very little in the way of hard sciences. Adrian himself said that he memorized the Gospels by rote in Greek, as well as portions of the Iliad and sermons by St. John Christosom. As we'll see later, um, how true this is is really up for debate, because uh, Adrian tended towards bombasticness. He tended to say a lot of really big things that just weren't true, or at, at best were exaggerations of the truth. Yeah. Um, but this is probably a good idea of what kind of background he got. He was probably learning these things, but maybe not to the extent or with the fluency that he describes himself yeah, as well, having. <laughs> memorizing the entire Gospels in Greek, uh, probably had to memorize a couple passages. <laughs> yeah, as exactly. Part of his Greek lesson. Yeah, there yeah. was probably a few like John three sixteen, mm -hmm. um, maybe some portions of like Luke mm -hmm. or something. The Christmas story. The Christmas story, something like that. Yeah. But not the whole gospel. No. no. <laughs> um, he went on to study at the Jesuit College in Saint Marie, which is known uh, as a kind of a school to prepare the ruling class of the French Canadians. Um, and he also started receiving an education in chemical engineering at the, uh, at the English language school, uh, McGill University. 
However, um, his training at McGill was cut short by Spanish influenza. Ah, uh, the Spanish flu. Yeah, so this is, we're now in post-World War I. Yeah. Soldiers are coming back and they've brought Sp- Spanish flu with them. And so the, the Institute had to be temporarily shut down. Um, in 1918, a year before he ended up leaving school, Adrian Arcand actually began working as a journalist. In 1920, after taking a few months off because of the outbreak, he was hired by the conservative paper La Partie to write a, quote, labor column. So apparently he was sort of continuing on his family tradition of being at least tertiarily involved in the labor movement. But keep in mind, he's writing for a conservative paper. Yeah. And he's writing a labor column for them. Um, From there, he moved on to write for the Montreal Star for a little while and eventually went on to the largest circulated French language paper, La Presse. Um, For a time, starting in 1923, he also served as a reservist in the Royal Canadian Militia Light Infantry. But that didn't really affect him a whole lot other than he served. He never actually ended up going to World War II uh, for reasons that will become abundantly clear later on. Um, His experiences in journalism eventually moved uh, him on to what would become his true passion, which is politics. Unlike many French Canadians, Adrien was not an Anglophobe. He was an Anglophile. Um, He had no issues with English or even with Canada's membership as part of the British Empire. According to him, he was raised in an atmosphere not conducive to separatist or anglophobic sentiment. Like his father, however, he was interested in union activities. Unlike his father, who was very much a left-wing union man, Adrian was drawn to the Catholic unions. So, in response to the labor unions being formed with all their dangerous foreign ideas, the Catholic Church actually founded a number of French unions in Quebec called Catholic Unions. These were very much uh, conservative unions. They were very much right-wing, morally, socially, and economically conservative unions that were centered around a kind of a French Catholic identity. Okay. Um, And so he, Adrian, uh, actually tried to start uh, a union for journalists. Um, It was the La Presse journalists in particular. He poured so much of his time into this work, about a year he spent trying to get this, um, but in 1929, he was, in his words, unceremoniously fired, and, um, and the union was never recognized, despite the Catholic Church writing the La Presse boss, uh, du, du Tremblay, and urging him to recognize the union. Which is interesting, because Du Tremblay actually did a lot of, like, press for the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Adrien Arcand was hoping is that if the church was writing him saying to do this, he would do it. Yeah. But he never does. He never ends up recognizing the union and, in fact, fires, uh, fires... Arcand, as well as a number of other people who were involved in trying to start the union. Um, Adrian found himself living in, quote, poverty for six months, uh, claiming in his bombastic fashion that his wife had only sugar, sh- that he and his wife had only sugar water heated with their own hands and feet with which to feed our children. Yeah. This reminds I'm not me. I'm buying it. This reminds me of your dad, uh, of your, of our grandpa talking about how uh, you're, if you become an artist, you'll be living off nothing but ketchup and water. That's right. <laughs> so losing this job was a, apparently quite a turning point in Adrian's worldview. He was devastated by this loss, and it seemed to make him realize that working within the establishment system wouldn't get him what he wanted, which. It's not really clear what he, wanted. What he wants. Uh, he's kind of conservative, but he's like a weird, he's not even a moderate. He's like a weird hybrid at this point. Um, in 1929, he began publishing his own satirical newspaper. And pardon me if I mispronounce this, but it's Le Goglu. Le Goglu. Uh, a Goglu being a species of small blackbird with a kind of a yellow cap on their heads 
uh, native to the Americas, whose English name is genuinely no less ridiculous, the Bobolink. Uh, the Bobolink. The Bobolink. In French, Canadian lingo, uh, lingo uh, goglu is also a term for someone who likes to joke around and laugh. It's a name akin to something like the Mockingbird. Uh, so if you were to make a newspaper called the Mockingbird yeah, or right. yeah. the Laughing Jay or something like that, it's, yeah. it's along those lines. The office for the Legoglu was located on St. Lawrence Boulevard in Montreal. Adrian Arcon described it as follows, and, well, brace yourself. I want to reiterate, these are his words. Not mine. Okay. His words. On that street are found Chinese gambling houses, Negro shacks, Greeks, cutthroat Slavs, nests of Bulgarian ruffians, Oriental grocers, nauseating Palestinian restaurants, European ex-convict scum, diamond importers from Chicago, and dives of every kind. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. I think I might need to wash my mouth out with some soap. Well, that, you know what? I mean, nothing, <laughs> nothing there would have been all that uh, uh, shocking for the day. Well, there's, there's a... I think the sentiment wouldn't have been that shocking, but there's a, this is kind of thing about saying the quiet part out loud that you just didn't do. And he was very much saying the quiet part out loud. Yeah, but <laughs> don't forget political correctness didn't exist. <laughs> At this time. No, that is that is true. Um, so Legoglu had numerous articles, all written under the pseudonym, pseudonym Emil Goglu, regardless of the actual authorship. Mm-hmm. Although most of the time it was Arcand, yeah, yeah. Um, or his buddies. He had a couple buddies that worked with him on this. Um, there were also cartoons that were drawn mostly by Albert Labelle, who signed them Al Goglu. And initially, they were kind of what you'd expect, your typical, oh, look at the fat cats in, you know, Ottawa. Oh, look at this frightened porcupine, you know, stuff like that. Uh, A lot of uh, semi-doctored pictures with catchy, snappy captions underneath, which is pretty much how political discord works now, too. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But as the quality of the cartoons improved, they became more and more directed towards disseminating Archon's anti-Semitic message. Okay. The satire was mostly in lampooning yellow journalism, creating fantastically bloody scenes of carnage and crime such that yellow papers would often feature on their front pages to get clicks. I mean, sell copies. (laughs) Because we obviously don't have yellow journalism as... Now dead. Yellow journalism yeah, is dead. Uh, news companies don't at all exploit headlines and tragedy in order to get attention. No siree. No, that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so over time, these started to give way to finding ways to platform our cons increasingly radical political message. Unsurprisingly, one of the most common targets of his attacks uh, was La Press and La Press's boss, De Tremblay, who was responsible for firing Arcand. Um, he was particularly disgusted with how La Press dared to celebrate Labor Day alongside union workers, which is pretty ironic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. I'll take the holiday. <laughs> but I disagree with the, uh, the actual, sentiment. The actual premise behind it, yeah. So... Arcand eventually leveraged the admittedly small circulation of his papers because he had several. He had uh, Le Goglu, Le Miroir, and an, another one, I think Le National or something like that, um, in, in order to start a movement. Oh, no, it was the camel. I don't remember how it's pronounced in French, but he had a third one that was called the camel. Um, in November of 1929, he told his readers that they needed to fight a battle and urged them to join his new order, the Order Patriotique de Goglu, or Patriotic Order of Bubble Links. <laughs> yeah. It was very much a conservative movement bent on, quote, general purification and protecting their Latin character. This movement also pushed to open Le Journal, an unabashedly conservative news rig. 
So they had a, a very broad direction for this political movement that he started, these, these, this patriotic order. And it's not openly anti-Semitic. Um, it was definitely conservative. Um, it simply claimed to be open to all classes of people, so long as they were good, respectable, sober men who liked to laugh and have a good time. Hmm. Um, and if they if they were white and French nationals, <laughs> yeah. So they initially didn't really have much of a political stance. It was undoubtedly conservative and yeah. definitely Catholic. But as far as what they were actually hoping to do and, or accomplish, it mostly seemed like they were there to give French Canadians more economic power and clean up public life, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea was simply to shock the system in some way. That's the way a lot of these anti-establishment movements start out. It's just they want to shock the system in some way to facilitate some sort of change, though oftentimes these anti-establishment movements have no idea what they actually want that change to be. Right. And that goes for the left and the right. It really is irrelevant. It's just when you're an anti-establishment movement and you don't have a clear direction. You, you just want change. You just want change. Um, the Goglus met for the first time on February 9th in 1930 uh, in Montreal. It was massive. They actually had to turn people away at the door, and they were seating people on the stage. Um, the room they were holding it in, the Monument National on St. Lawrence Boulevard, was also a popular site for all sorts of political and intellectual meetings, including many in the Jewish community, which Archon didn't like. And he actually later on tried to convince the society that was responsible for organizing the building to close their doors to Jewish events. Um, They never did. And so he tried to infiltrate the society in order to get them to close the doors to Jewish events, and he never succeeded. (laughs) They continued holding events for everybody as long as they could pay the dues. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Arcand would go on to run many other conservative news regs, but his publications were growing increasingly uh, anti-Semitic. And this was actually beginning to cost him financial support. Um, in the 1930 Canadian election, he managed to get some of this money back by backing R.B. Bennett, a conservative politician. Um, but the funding they received from him was very spotty, and over time he just stopped getting money. And now he had no advertisers. In 1933, no advertisers were left to support Le Goglu. Uh, and when a fire finally took their building, their meager $8,000 of insurance was just not enough to replace all the equipment they lost. On top of the fact that this was the third such fire. Oh. And they had a number of lawsuits that they were facing from like a lot of Jewish groups and some non-Jewish groups. Yeah. Um, because of the nasty rhetoric they'd been yeah. printing in their magazine yeah. under the guise of quote-unquote satire, yeah. which it, it was, I think, increasingly becoming clear this was not. Yeah, you, you can smear peanut butter on shit, and it's still shit. <laughs> it's With peanut exa- butter on it. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right. Um, so as a result, the publishing of, of Le Mirror and, and Le Goglu uh, ended in March 1933. And the last issue was spent describing and glorifying the political system that Adrian Arcand had come to understand. Um, a uniquely French-Canadian take on fascism. Well, you know, it was really popular in the day. <laughs> it really was. It, it was amazingly popular. Yes, there were... Worldwide. Well, it, he had a peculiar blend of uh, traditional French-Canadian conservatism. Um, the Catholic faith, and a very much German-influenced anti-Semitic fascism. Right. According to the book The Canadian Führer, The Life of Adrian Arcand, which is one of the main sources for today's episode, for Arcand, a true fascist was defined first and foremost by a foundational hatred of the Jews. (laughs) So this this isn't a guy who is... You know, oh, the Jews are just really uh, a symptom of the greater problem or whatever. However, people try to, you know, 
couch their couch anti- their anti semitism. Yeah. He's just if you're not a true fascist if you don't if you don't hate, hate Jews. Jews. Yeah. <laughs> Which seems to me to be a pretty simplistic take on it. Like I don't think he was as astute as he yeah. as he pretends because I mean uh, there were forms of fascism that were not anti Semitic. Yeah, um, a lot of his opponents pushed for uh, a kind of a Portuguese-style fascism, right. which was primarily Catholic in identity. Okay. Um, so, like, we'll talk a little bit about them. We don't get too deep into them, but there were a number of French-Canadian fascist groups. Uh, fascism in Canada was a very French-Canadian movement. There were Anglophones who were fascist as well, but it was most popular in Quebec. Right. Um, which makes sense when you consider that Quebec was a far more morally conservative province than the rest of Canada. Yeah. And had a much more um, unique identity than right. the rest of Canada. The rest of Canada at this time primarily saw itself as British. Yeah, and and where it wasn't, it was a mosaic. It was, yeah. simply, it was simply smatterings of people from all, yeah. all n- nations of Europe, yeah. pretty much. But Anglo-Canada was still very much considered themselves part of the British Empire. Yeah. Even Archon does. And that's what sets him apart from the other French-Canadian fascists. Is Archon actually becomes part of a pan-Canadian fascist movement. Okay. Um, whereas the rest of the French-Canadian fascists wanted to basically separate and form their own country of Laurenti right. uh, to basically be their own little fascist country. And so they were taking more inspiration from uh, Benito Mussolini, and I can't remember his name, but the, the guy in charge of Portugal. Um, Portugal or, or Spain? Portugal. Okay, I'm not sure. His uh, because his b- main identity was, it, was that he was Catholic. Okay. He happened to be a fascist leader who was Catholic. Right. And he never got involved with um, Hitler like Mussolini did. But at this time, Mussolini is still very much his own thing. And he's still also very Catholic in his identity. I kind of wonder, like the Franco and the Spaniards, I know they were neutral in the war. Yep. In the Second War. But were they anti-Semitic as well? Because they were fascists. I don't know as much about Franco. Um <clears throat> But, I mean, you have to also keep in mind that a big part of, of fascism is about having an in-group. Right. So, it's like Mussolini was anti-Semitic more by coincidence um, because of his involvement with Hitler. Hitler. But, for the most part, he was very anti-Gypsy, for instance. Right. <laughs> uh, a very anti-socialist. Mm-hmm. As another big part of fascist movements is a... Identity as not being socialist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it, it, what a lot of the other French Canadians, they're, they're, they're fine with the anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. Um, but their main focus is on being on Frenchness. Yes. And on not being Anglophones. Right. Uh, whereas Arcand doesn't care. No, he doesn't. He, he wants a nationwide fascism. Yes, he wants he wants a Canadian fascism that is still part of the British Empire. Um, so, Archon considered Hitler to be a brave and courageous leader, someone who was willing to ask the uh, quote unquote Jewish question in a way that Canadian legislators just weren't. Mm-hmm. Um, he put a huge emphasis on serving, which is another big thing in fascism is is hierarchy. Yeah. And so one must serve their boss, their leaders, their priests. And, and this fits well with that idea of like the one big strong leader, which is mm-hmm. the main facet of fascism, this kind of cult of personality. On May 4th of 1933, Archand launched his new paper, Le Patriot. Uh, Le Patriot was not a satirical paper. It wasn't even pretending to be sat- satirical. It was a full-on fascist rag. Uh, it praised Hitler's government and used a swastika as its logo. Oh. <laughs> Leaving no question where this this paper's political leanings were. He did later add a cross to the logo. 
<laughs> oh, nice. Well, because Archon, he's yeah, still a sense. still a Christian movement yes. in Archon's mind. Yeah. So, like, while he did not have the Catholicism as the main thrust of his identity, it was still very much part of his identity. Which really is confusing when you consider the news that was coming out of Germany about the fascist government's treatment of Christians of all stripes. Right. Both Protestant and Catholic were being locked up as dissidents. In, <laughs> uh, in Hitler's government? Yeah. Yeah, well, although the Catholic Church... Very, very briefly had a little stint, but they were next on the list after Jews. Yeah, they were doing the tap dance, though. They, they, well, unlike, unlike um, well, some of the, some of the Catholic bishops in Germany took a stand yeah. against Hitler and paid the price. Yeah, D- Diedrich Bonhoeffer was one. Well, he was Lutheran though, wasn't he? Was he? I thought he, he was, was. He was Lutheran. I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm not positive, but I'm yeah. pretty sure he was. I'm pretty sure he was a Lutheran, not bishop, whatever they had. Mm-hmm. I don't they remember. They had bishops in that Lutheran church as well. I think in some of them. I don't remember yeah. which ones. Um, ah, anyways. <laughs> that's a discussion for a different day. Yeah. So they, there was a lot of, uh, because yes, there was a little brief period where the Catholic church kind of was able to dance around, but no, a lot of them were getting locked up because a lot of them were helping to smuggle Jews out right. of Germany. Right. Um. And so it was, yeah, not good. Um, Despite its strong Catholic leanings, the Catholic Church itself actually denounced Archon's movement as contrary to Christ's teachings. Mm -hmm. Um, In 1934, Archon finally bit the bullet and founded the Parti National Social Chrétien, or the Christian National Social Party, um, which was a fascist party. Yeah. No hold barred at this point. Anything national socialist is Nazi. Yes. Um, Arcand often found himself at loggerheads with other French fascists who favored not a British Canada as Arcand did, but rather a new nation for French Canadians, as we discussed, called Laurenti. Uh, Arcand, however, had far loftier dreams. He wanted a pan-Canadian fascist movement that didn't differentiate between Anglophone or Francophone. So long as you weren't a Jew, black, or Chinese, or, well, anything, anything other than else. French or English, <laughs> uh, you were welcome in Arkans, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, leading up to this, he had been courting uh, what was a, a young nationalists movement, which was a young fascist movement that was very popular in, in Quebec at the time. Um, but, as he kind of pushed more and more for this pan-Canadian movement, this movement that had no problem with being British, and that was a they viewed as a very foreign fascism as opposed to a nice homegrown Catholic French fascism. Yeah. Um, he actually started to lose a lot of the support that he had from these young fascist movements. So there was a big question about how was he going to grow the movement if he couldn't draw in these young fascist movements. Um, well, they held a lot of meetings. Uh, the the uh, his his magazine published the dates for these, and they often had to rent out church halls in false names because they had no support from the Catholic Church, but they needed these big buildings to host their events in. So they would get a fake name, book the hall, and hold their their uh, PNSC rally over in this in this church hall. Mm-hmm. Um, anti-Semitism and fascism were gaining real traction in Canada at this time. Many Canadian politicians uh, were actually resisting uh, Jewish refugees who were fleeing to seek asylum in Canada. It's not a secret that prior to World War II, and even after, many refugees were turned away by Canada. At this time, Canada was in the grip of an economic depression, and people were looking for a scapegoat for their problems. If we remember back to the um, Mac- Mac- uh, Mackenzie Papineau Battalion episode, right. we discussed how the Canadian government charged soldiers who fought in the Spanish Civil War with premature anti-fascism. Yeah. 
So I want you to put that in perspective with what we're discussing here. This is around the time that these people are getting charged with that. Mm -hmm. And yet we have these very clear, radical, anti-establishment movements that are fascist in nature. Yeah. And the government is doing nothing about them. It, it was attractive uh, to the world at that time for some strange reason. It, well, it, well, because it, I think because the old powers were losing their grip. Yeah. And so the fascist movement tried to solidify those powers again. Yeah. It, it's a, a very bizarre. And, I, it, you know, I like to say that this was all just stuff that was happening back then, but we see the exact same thing happening now. Yeah. Uh, in, in not just America, but even in Canada with Maxime Bernier. We have it happening in England right now with the whole Brexit movement. Uh, yeah. In Western Canada with the Wexit movement is very much a fascist movement, despite yeah. what people may otherwise claim. Yeah. Um, it's There's a lot of this going on all over the world. And so it wasn't just a thing that happened back then. It's a thing that's happening now, too. And what's interesting to me is the way that Arcand basically radicalized his audience. So he started them out with just getting these little slivers of anti-Semitism in his quote-unquote joke paper. Yeah. Um, and then eventually just drops the act once he's already got everybody on hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. And he forms a whole party for them. Hey, guess what? We're Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> and we see this exact same thing happening now. Yeah. Um, like with people who were maybe getting into Alex Jones really early on when he was just a weird kind of anti-establishment guy, but who were stuck with him and have now gotten basically led all over the place by his platforming of these very dangerous right-wing individuals like Richard Spencer, who is mm -hmm. very much... He identifies as a white nationalist. <laughs> like, yeah. he doesn't pretend he's anything other than that. Yeah. Um, and we have that going on in Canada, too, with people like Stefan Molyneux, who maybe lure you in with the self-help rhetoric, or Jordan Peterson, who does the same thing. They lure you in with this kind of idea of, like, self-help, pop psychology stuff. But as you start listening to them, and then you start listening to their friends, and that just leads you down the rabbit hole. And the YouTube, the YouTube algorithm has been shown to do this mm -hmm. where you'll start watching something innocent, like the latest Drake and Josh. What? I don't know. What, what do the kids listen to these days? I'm not sure. The, the latest Billie Eilish music video. Yeah. We was listening to that and then you'll get recommendations in your sidebar that will be like, maybe you're into nine 11 trutherism or something. Yeah. yeah. It's not usually that extreme a jump, but it's like you'll get led there. And eventually the algorithm just starts suggesting to you all this really crazy stuff because the algorithm just looks for what's the most eye-catching. Yes. And oftentimes the the headlines, as we see with Arcand here and his yellow journals, his spoofing of yellow journalism, the right has often the snappier headlines. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. It's it's a lot easier to be scared than it is to want to fight for something useful. Yeah, yeah. And that's what the right relies on, is, is especially when you're dealing with the crazy far right like these guys are. Well, I think, you know, like even with, um, <clears throat> with we could probably go on a browser right now. Yeah. Because with the uh, sort of uh, algorithms and the stuff that all the web hosting services have, They've been listening to us. So <laughs> if, I, if I hit the Google searchy thing yeah. and say surprise me or whatever, I wouldn't be surprised if something about Nazis showed up. Yeah. It happens time and again with, with uh, people tell me that they were uh, just talking up with their friend about, on the phone, they were talking with their friend about uh, maybe wanting to look at uh, some paint. Yeah. Or, or something for some renovations. And then they get an ad for paint. And then suddenly they get ads for paint. Yeah. Well, that happens all the time, yeah. Yeah. So, Arkan's movement grew, and in October of 1934, the PNSC merged with a similar Anglo movement, the Canadian Nationalist Party, which was based primarily out of Alberta. Arkan's movement would continue to grow from here. In 1938, it merged with the Canadian Nazi parties and the so-called swastika clubs from Ontario and Quebec. Oh, 
Yeah, so swastika <laughs> clubs were a big thing. So right around when Hitler's getting popular yeah. and the symbolism of the swastika is changing because of that, these so-called swastika clubs started cropping up all over the place, which are just little Canadian Nazi gatherings. Wow. <laughs> so it, it's amazing. Just, But apparently the problem is socialists. Yeah. God forbid you <laughs> you want to have labor rights. If you hate Jews, we're totally fine with you. But if you want to get a minimum wage. Yeah. Ooh, you. damn you. Stole straight to hell. <laughs> it's just mind blowing. And and the they're mad at the people fighting the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. Yeah. Because they might be slightly communist. Like this is no, <laughs> the no, it's mind a messed up world at this time. <laughs> oh my god. What, so what, yes. What year are we at right now? 1938. Yeah. We're not even in World War II yet. Yeah, no, we're we're still at the height of Hitler's popularity worldwide. Yep. Well, that didn't last too long. In 1939, Canada officially declared war on Germany, joining the British in the European war effort. Uh, they were behind the British by like 24 hours. Yeah. Because we wanted to make sure things went through Parliament. Well, we wanted to <laughs> declare as a nation unto ourselves yeah. rather than, yeah. So this put into effect something called the War Measures Act. Now, I don't know how many of our listeners are familiar with the War Measures Act. It's essentially dictatorship. Yeah, well, that's what Trump, <laughs> Trump was trying to uh, enact yes. uh, with those uh, with the Iranian conflict yeah. a couple weeks ago. Yeah, uh, executive like, powers. Uh, yeah, Executive powers and was blocked. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so Canada oh, used blocked. to have... <laughs> we, we got rid of this after the FLQ crisis in the 70s. Yeah. But Canada used to have something called the War Measures Act, which is any time Canada went to war, the government could enact the War Measures Act, which allowed any police officer to detain someone for indefinitely uh, for any reason. Yeah. Uh, so long as they were... Assumed to be somehow anti Canadian. Mm-hmm. Um, this allowed Canada on May 30th of 1940 to arrest Arcand and put him in an internment camp and to ban his party. Arcand was locked in the camp where he allegedly sat on a throne that other prisoners had built for him. You're kidding. Uh, claiming he would be Fuhrer of Canada when Hitler won the war. Oh my. <laughs> so he deserved his spot in the environment. Oh goodness, yes. He he was a, he was arrested uh, for attempting to overthrow the government. Yeah. <laughs> so he remained interred until the end of the war. But German Germany's loss didn't stop him. He reformed his party after the War Measures Act was lifted and even ran for office in 1949. He ran as a national unity candidate, which was the new name for his party, now that it had merged with uh, all the swastika clubs. Yeah. He was now the national unity party, I guess, um, and actually managed to win 29% of the vote in his writing, which is about 0.7% more than Maxime Bernier won in his writing yeah, in the last yeah. election. <laughs> Um, Arcand ran a second time in a different writing in 1953, and that time he won 39% of the vote, but still didn't get the seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need... It's not so much that you, you need to beat the other guy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so even as late as 1965, Arcand could still draw a crowd of 650 people. Hmm. On April 1st of 1967... Adrian Arcon died. Good riddance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in 2016, Adrian Arcon was played by Haley Joel Osment in Kevin Smith's movie Yoga Hosers. And in the grand strategy game Hearts of Iron, if you change Canada to a fascist ideology, the country becomes run by Adrian Arcon. <laughs> a little blip on the radar of Canadian <laughs> history, I would say. <laughs> yeah. So that was the story of a real Canadian fascist. Kind of interesting, though. You think about it, and, uh, you know, it, this is one of those what-if scenarios, you know. Yeah. Um, what, would the, what would Canada have looked like had, he, had Hitler been successful? Therefore, he would then have been... 
Well, here's an interesting thought. Um, I don't think Hitler would have conquered Europe. I don't think he would have gone any further than Russia did during the Cold War. And I think we would have seen a totally different Cold War. Yeah. Instead of that Cold War being between America and Russia, it probably would have been between America and Germany. Yeah. I, or it would have been between Germany and Russia. Yeah. And, and America would just go back to being the isolationist country that it yeah. remains to this day. Yeah. So it, it's, um, I, I think it would have changed just kind of mm-hmm. politics, how politics is viewed as a whole, and fascism would have been as normalized as socialism is now. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, With the passing of Hitler, because his health was so bad. Yes. I mean, he would have died and then... Well, and his successors were arguably far more competent than he ever could have dreamt to have been. Yeah. Uh, What he had was a cult of personality, which admittedly is really important in a fascist dictatorship. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just look at um, the the country to the south of us. Oh, yeah. Huge right. cult of personality. Definitely fascist leanings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and you see that even in Britain right now. Yeah, with old Boris. With old Boris, who yeah. is, a, he's been a joke even of himself. He's, mm-hmm. he's like a parody of himself, but he manages to tap into that kind of zeitgeist, that kind of fear. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately the main driver of fascism, whereas the main driver of socialism is typically constructive. Yes. Fascism's main driver is typically destructive. It's it's about fear of being destroyed. Right. And the brief period, uh, even in Russian history and USSR history, where Stalin had his dictatorship, that was which not, was that was not communism. No, that was essentially fascism. That was a that was its own form of fascism. Yeah. Uh, or despotism, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And with his passing, much saner minds took. Yes, and took ultimately, um, ultimately deconstructed the USSR. Yeah, into something a little more manageable and less imperialistic. Although, what we have now over there is definitely a fascist yeah. oligarchy. Yeah, again, yeah, um, they are probably one of the few truly fascist nations currently in existence, along with um, the Philippines. Uh, under what's his nuts? Oh yeah, uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the, the guy who literally sends death squads out yeah. looking for drug addicts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Duterte. Duterte. Yes. Yeah. Duterte. But here's the thing, Ben. Hmm. Um, fascism or lizard people? I would. I wish it was lizard people. Because <laughs> no, Trumps. Skin suit is looking mighty like. Oh, um, I, I, we were actually joking about this the other day because we I was looking uh, over the stuff that happened under Obama. Yeah. And most of it was just as bad, if not worse, than a lot of what Trump has done. But the thing is that Obama's human suit fit far better than Trump's does. It did. Yeah. <laughs> um, although Obama looked much more like a lizard. Yes. Uh, the same way that Gwyneth Paltrow looks like. Especially him. because his, um, he started to get kind of ashy in his yeah. later years. Although he and Gwyneth are more like the frog people. Ah, yes. <laughs> and I think that Donald is more like a um, sort of a crocodilian. I don't even know if he's a crocodilian. He's uh, some sort of amorphous, um, sentient moss. You might be right. <laughs> his choice of his choice of skin suit is really in poor taste, almost as if he can't envision having a body at all. No, no, it's a uh, it's sags. It's like a trash bag, just mm. stuffed with moss. I, know, I, noticed, <laughs> I noticed in his in his speeches over the whole Iran affair how that one part of his face just kept sort of. Sloughing off. Sloughing or drooping or something. Yeah. And someone made the comment, it looked like he had a bruise on the side of his face. Yeah. Um, I wonder if Melania is beating him for one. I, I wonder if he's just drinking too much. <laughs> or, I don't know, he's on Actually, he's, he's, apparently, he's apparently a pretty hardcore teetotaler. He doesn't touch alcohol. Yeah. He drinks Diet Coke and then eats like half a pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Half a pizza wrapped around a cheeseburger. And then a Tic Tac. <laughs> mm. Tic Tac, so I have that minty breath. Gotta have that. Oh, I'm sure he smells 
Not at all like yeast. <laughs> <laughs> he smells like dope. <laughs> just, just, you get close to him and you just, you know when you got like a really bad athlete's foot? Yeah. You get that kind of a yeasty odor? Yeah. That's what he probably smells like most of the time. Yeah. Anyways, that's enough about Trump. Yeast and butt sweat. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that's Nobody haunting. To, no one wants to sit in the White House chair that, after Oh, he's no. <laughs> They're just going to burn it. Got a new one. Who knows where that thing's been? In the remodeling. All right, guys. You can find me on Twitter. At Canuckonomicon, you can find us on patreon.com slash Canuckonomicon or on ko-fi.com slash Canuckonomicon. Please send us money so I can get a computer. Uh, well, I have a good Another one. one. I don't need another one. I need I need uh, memory is what I need right now. I oh, need yeah? something. You're already running out of memory? I'm gonna once I start working on my other show, which launches next month, you by the way, guys. Not. You've got a terabyte. That's like masses of memory. It's true. I've already used about half of it on games. Oh, well, that's you. <laughs> that's your redemption, my friend. All right, everybody. Have a good night and uh, keep your eyes open. Good day. Canuckonomicon is a production of Crossing Clay Studios. We can be found on Twitter at Canuckonomicon and you can contact us through email at Canuckonomicon at gmail.com Please be sure to share us with your friends and family and keep your eyes open.